So, good evening, everyone. Uh, from this week, we are meeting here at Apollo every Wednesday, unlike uh, usually. And with our new lecture, we are presenting a new speaker, uh, who is a professor of Ilya University of uh, European and Caucasian Studies, who would uh, present all of his uh, rich professional background uh, in a second. Uh, meanwhile, I'm uh, reminding you that we are here not only to listen uh, and to learn, but also to fundraise some funds for Helping to Live, an evacuation project for Ukraine. Uh, please feel free to leave your donations on the table or tap the link in the description and donate online. It's still very much needed, unfortunately. Uh, today's lecture uh, is called German and Cultural Heritage in Georgia. And we're going to talk uh, about, first listen and then talk and ask questions, uh, about quite a massive uh, influence of uh, modern <laughs> Germany and uh, Germany of 17th, 18th, 19th century and especially 20th century and uh, um, we're going to learn uh, how much uh, German community uh, affected development or political and social and cultural development of Georgia uh, before a lot of representatives of that community were uh, deported uh, to Kazakhstan and that is the, the page of the Georgian history and the history of the German community here that is not necessarily well known by many people. So it's a very <coughs> important topic and we have a perfect specialist to talk to about. Thank you very much. Please welcome Oliver Reisner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to me here in this historic environment, so the first cinema theater in Tbilisi, in a neighborhood that in fact was established by German uh, colonists. Yeah? So therefore the uh, venue is, fits very well to the topic I'm talking about today, even if, as you see, also the uh, condition of this heritage is also quite telling. Um, yeah, but the, about this a little bit later. So my name is Oliver Reisner. I shortly mentioned I graduated in uh, Slavic languages and literatures and East European history, what in Germany mainly was Russian and Soviet history that I graduated, came here in Georgia during the perestroika for the very first time as an exchange student, probably like you, for a three month stay, stay and this then changed my life because then I wrote my master thesis about Georgia as a part of the Russian Empire, my PhD thesis about uh, uh, nation building in Georgia uh, in late 19th, early 20th century uh, by uh, investigating or writing a collective uh, biography of the members of a learned society uh, for the spread of literacy among the Georgians. Yes, and uh, then in 2003 I came here working with World Vision, implementing an EU-funded project on the integration of ethnic diverse youth. Probably you have already heard that there are a major uh, uh, minority groups in Georgia, Azerbaijani communities, Armenian communities, and so on. So the Germans about uh, who I uh, about those who I'm talking about today, there is no German community uh, any longer here, only maybe a new one. And uh, this was funded, this project with World Vision was funded by the EU, European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights. So I got a job offer by the EU delegation and from 2005 to 2015 I was working here in the delegation on minority rights, on education, research, parliamentary reform. That's why I became a specialist in uh, European studies at Ilya University. So, um, but the Caucasian studies is very important for me. So, um, 
Today I will give you uh, an overview a little bit about the history, about how the Germans ended up in Georgia, not only separate travel uh, scholars traveling the country for doing investigation for the Russian Empire about the condition of the people and the uh, uh, environment, the geography and so on, but really as a part of the imperial project. And then in my second part I will talk about what heritage do we still have here? Uh, I, I will not go into much, too much detail, but give you some pictures so that you get some impression. And uh, yeah, and then looking about a little bit the discussion, what to do with heritage, how to leave it, how to, uh, yeah, that it does not end up as a museum, as dead things, but that they are used for a purpose. And this is always a question important not only for German cultural heritage here in Georgia, but also for the huge amount of diverse heritage that exists in Georgia. And this diversity is really something that deserves more appreciation and also more um, yeah, support, because there are so many heritage sites, mainly Orthodox churches and so on, uh, that the country, the government, cannot really afford really all to, to, uh, yeah, to preserve all that. Okay, so uh, everything started with the eruption of a, a, a volcano in the Pacific Ocean and in, nowadays Indonesia. The Mount Tambora erupted in 1815 and this caused global climate crisis. Not man-made in this period because industrialization just started in the UK, uh, uh, but really a, 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 a natural one and it caused a, a lot of uh, uh, yeah, climatic changes also in Western Europe, among them in southern Germany, in Swabia, where there were misharvests because there was a summer in 1815 that was like a winter. So it was very cold, snow was falling and so on, misharvest. And it was just the end of the Napoleonic Wars that had a serious impact on the living conditions, heavy taxation, so the kings needed to refill their uh, uh, treasury with uh, the incomes of their subjects. Yeah? Mm. So here you see really something what we are trying to do in a bigger research project really to bring the Caucasus into global history and here we have one example of it, how events on the other part of the world had an impact on uh, uh, developments also here in Georgia or in the Caucasus. That was, and now I'm starting with the history, uh, since the 18th century Russian Empire, since Peter the Great really uh, uh, became an empire and used really also to develop its uh, diverse regions of the uh, empire. Catherine the Great herself of German origin, invited German settlers, so-called colonists, from uh, Germany uh, to the Volga Basin. Yeah? So this was the beginning in 1768, the famous manifesto, you can see it here, uh, really inviting peasants, craftsmen and so on to come to the Russian Empire. And this then was renewed by her, her son Alexander I in 1804. This was a period when the Russian Empire also expanded into the South Caucasus or into the Caucasus area in general. Yeah? So they really tried to use colonists to uh, 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 develop frontier areas of their empire, of their growing land empire by New establishing new settlements with colonies, so, uh, um, and this was also something that was applied to the Caucasus. In the 18th and 19th century, unfortunately I do not have an English map here for that, but from Germany, it was far from a united uh, country, uh, thousands of people 
migrated. There is much more known about the Germans that migrated to the United States, to America and so on, but not a lesser degree also migrated into the Russian Empire because of these favorable conditions that were offered to them. And you see from different parts of, uh, of Germany, um, so, uh, and what I'm talking about is the Kingdom of Württemberg, Swabia, which is a Protestant kingdom. And uh, next uh, we have Bavaria, which is a Catholic one. So you see in the 18th and 19th century, identity was not so much based on uh, nationality, but on religious beliefs. And in Germany, this was really until the uh, 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 second half of the 20th century that it was impossible for a Protestant, Protestant to marry a Catholic woman or vice versa. Yeah? So these religion, religious beliefs were also one of the reasons why these Germans then very often resettled because they were granted uh, uh, freedom of belief. Yeah? So you see, uh, a different parts. This is the Volga Basin here, but others also uh, migrated to uh, 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 southern Ukraine. You see here all these small uh, settlements and so on. And what I'm talking about is then here the, the settlement in the Caucasus that started in 1817. And all the major documents for the success story of the Russian imperial administration, how they used German colonists in Georgia, are published in a voluminous uh, source collection, the Akti Sobrane Kafkaskava Aishografitschkai Kamisieu Kafkaskaya. This is online, so you can all these thousands of pages find on the uh, Iverieli Georgian online library, so you can, you really do not go to the library any longer, they are there. And there you can see how the Russian Empire was presenting the history of these colonies in the Caucasus. Um, we have, in f we look on the reasons of migration, uh, so-called push and pull factors. So I mentioned the increased uh, burden from taxation after the Napoleonic Wars. There was also economic hardship, crop failures due to the Tambora eruption, I mentioned that, but also uh, due to inheritance regulations and there was a lack of land, land in uh, southern Germany and most important for many of them were religious restrictions. Due to enlightenment, there were reforms in the Protestant church, also in church service, that these people in uh, southern Germany, also in parts of Switzerland, uh, neglected. And they co co uh, convened among themselves without a priest, without a pastor, and really read the Bible, the Holy Bible together, and so on and so on. And they were so-called pietists. And uh, because of their behavior, it was very much also like a social movement, uh, that they uh, were convening together, having their own groups and, 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 and uh, uh, collectivities, that um, they were also called separatists. Yeah? Separatists from the Lutheran Church. Yeah? And we're expecting the end of the world, Armageddon, the return of Jesus Christ to earth in 1836 and therefore wanted to be closer to the promised land, to Jerusalem and saw a good opportunity in this uh, 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 offer by the Tsarist state. And because the Tsarist state offered tax exemption for a limited period, generous land allocations, liberation from military service, freedom of trade, interest-free trade loans for all purchases, permission to buy land. However, they were not allowed to settle where they wanted, so the Tsarist administration wanted to have them to um, reduce the um, share of the Muslim population in the South Caucasus. Therefore, they were using 
not only Protestants from Germany, but also sectarians from uh, central Russian gubernia, like Molokane, Duchaborci, and others that were resettled to the nowadays it's uh, southern Georgia, the border to Turkey and Armenia. No? And they were granted autonomy and local self-government until 1871, and then they were integrated into the overall civil administration. And very important, free exercise of religion. Yeah? So you see, there was a good match for this uh, uh, migration from Kingdom of Württemberg, from the region of Swabia, very uh, I do not know how to translate this into English, Schaffe, Schaffe, Häuser, so hard-working people to build their own homes, homes and so on, really with a very strong worth ethic. And they convened and decided really to leave. You see map of uh, the period, early 19th century, you see Germany was far from a United State. Yeah, so uh, uh, this was a kingdom of uh, Württemberg and then here in the southern parts Tübingen is uh, maybe some of you, Stuttgart, you know, Schweigheim and so on from these areas, Baden, this is more Catholic, but also Switzerland uh, and so on, there were uh, Esslingen, Reutlingen and so on from these small towns, uh, several thousand of people uh, uh, decided to emigrate. The first were 19 families from Reutlingen, also, also in uh, near Tübingen in, in, in Swabia. Overall we had then 1,400 families and 6,000 people that emigrated to the Tsarist Empire uh, uh, in the 18, from 1817 to 1820s. 1820s yeah? They were formed so-called harmonies, harmonien that were traveling together as groups. Yeah? So really also to uh, 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 pray to God together and so on, really it was very much based on this religious community. They took the so-called Ulmer Schachteln, Ulm boxes, a kind of recycling boat, and entered the Danube River at the city of Ulm, that's why they were called there, and uh, traveled down with these Ulmer Schachteln, they were overcrowded with the people, so because to save money for the very expensive uh, 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 trip, and uh, then they were resampled, traveled down the whole Danube River, you see Vienna, Budapest, and so on, until, uh, so through the uh, 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 Austro-Hungarian Empire until Galatz, and there was a border to the Russian Empire. They shifted from the gold because they could only leave after the king of Württemberg allowed them to leave because they were subjects and without this allowance to be freed from the subjecthood of the king, they could not leave. Yeah? And they became then granted the uh, citizenship or uh, uh, yeah, citizenship of the Tsar, citizens of the Tsar or subjects of the Tsar. Uh, so entered into what is today Ukraine here uh, and had near Odessa had to be in uh, quarantine because a lot of illnesses when the people were all together on these small boats and so on and so forth. Yeah? Here in one of uh, the uh, texts that we have, a Heimatbuch, Katharinenfeld, uh, uh, Ernst Almendinger described that this was mainly these uh, religious people, but there were also people looking for, for religious fanaticism, but also followers that were trying to find mana, mana, mana. Yeah? Okay, so it, mainly it was religious uh, regions, but also socio-economic ones. Good. And then, uh, so they traveled, and th some of them decided then to stay here in, in southern in the southern part or, or the northern part of the Black Sea Basin, but others decided to continue there, Rastov Nadanu, and then they crossed the Caucasus mountain range, the so-called uh, Georgian military highway, and uh, down, went down to Tiflis and arrived here in uh, summer 19, uh, 18, 
uh, 17, the first harmony arrived here. And then they settled in different settlements. Some of them, you see here a map from 1856 where there are the German settlements uh, uh, highlighted around Tiflis, so Tbilisi. Uh, one of the first was Marienfeld in 1817 established. This is nowadays Sartichala. You pass it when you travel to Kachiti. Yeah? And there are also houses and so on left there. Peters, uh, Peters uh, Dorf was the second one. Then we had Alexandersdorf. Um, this is here in... Uh, today it is apart from Tbilisi. It's a district, it's called Didube. There is a metro station there. And so on, I, I will show you in a, in a while. And Neutiflis is where we are here now. So this was Neutiflis. You see, in 1856, it was not part of Tbilisi. Was, but Tbilisi then started to become an urban center and expanded. And this part, Neutiflis, became one of the most modern parts of the, set, of the city. That's why you find here in this neighborhood, on this road, uh, a lot of Art Nouveau buildings and so on and so forth. Very straight streets and then behind the buildings there were very often small gardens and so on because this was how they uh, established it. And some of them are preserved until today. If you pass on uh, maybe a kilometer from here, on the left side there is a rose garden, yeah, Vardis Bari. And this is uh, one of those few uh, uh, gardens or yards that survived until today. There are very few and you have really to look it up, but they exist. So Neutiflis, then we have Elisabethtal, it's today Asureti, half an hour drive from here, very well preserved. And we have one of the biggest uh, centers, this is Katharinenfeld, Bolnisi. I do not know if one of you have already been there, visited, or not yet. Have you been outside Pelisi so far? Yeah? To the mountains, to Kacheti, yeah? And Svaneti maybe. Okay, so this is to the south, and uh, uh, yeah. And then we have two more so-called uh, uh, mother colonies, uh, Annenfeld and Helenendorf. They are located in nowadays Azerbaijan, in uh, Gögöl and in Hamshir. So, yeah, and you see really several certain families, Helene of 120 families, uh, Katharinenfeld 135, so they came together. But the beginning was very, very hard, really. They had nothing, uh, they had to, no housing and so on. They relied on the support by the local peasants with food and so on. They had no housing and they, uh, they were because also they did not want to, to stay. They were planning to just to stay there for a while and did not become economically active because of the hardship in the beginning, of course, but also because they were expecting the end of the world and, yeah, and disappointed the uh, hope that uh, um, the Tsarist administration had in inviting these German colonists that they would really improve the economic environment, produce foodstuff, wine and so on for the Russian army because the local peasants were not producing enough to fulfill, to meet the demands of, of the Russian military that was in the South Caucasus still until 1829 fighting Ottoman Empire and Iranian Empire for really their superiority in this area. So the Russian it was a frontier region, no borders yet, but a transition, a, a period of transition. And they tried with this military administration con conquest, but also with these colonists really to acquire, to co get control of this area. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, only in the second half of the 19th century when the Russian army prevented those pietists from moving on to Jerusalem in 1836 and this uh, Armageddon, this uh, uh, youngest day did not arrive, then they settled really down and became economically active. Because they 
con preserved all their knowledge of winemaking, of craftsmanship, how to produce this kind of wine, um, yeah, how is this in English, this uh, wooden uh, wine barrels, barrels yeah, no? because in, in the Caucasus this was unknown. They were, they were producing the wine and then transporting it in a skin from cows or from pigs and so on and that there is no, that the uh, 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 liquids were not lost so they had to put a special kind of uh, nafti on it and this had a bad impact on, on the, um, on the, on the um, yeah, how it, uh, on the taste, on the taste. So in that sense really uh, the winemaking for a bigger demand is some part of agriculture where the Germans were prominent and dominant here. By the end of the 19th century, the German wine production, overall of the wine production in the Tsarist Empire had a share from 8 to 9 percent, what was quite huge. Yeah? Mm. So they were producing, having these special katas, craftsmanship, and they had their spirit of community, working together as a community, what is very important. Yeah? Good. In the meantime, also here in, uh, uh, in Tbilisi, but also Baku in the second half of the 19th, we have a new flow. These were the colonies, but then also a lot of uh, experts, we would call them, yeah, today, uh, like the brother Siemens, who were coming to Tbilisi. They have maybe some of you have in Sololaki seen this plate, remembering here uh, uh, the the brother Siemens, because they were constructing the telegraph line from London to Calcutta. So you see modernity. Uh, uh, maybe you know. Uh, um, Osterhammel's book about the great transformation, a global history of the 19th century. In the second half of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, Caucasus, Tbilisi, Baku were totally integrated into this first wave of globalization and offered opportunities to a lot of those experts that came here. Of course, not only from Germany, but also from Belgium and so on. Some from the UK, gardening and so on in Western Georgia for a nobleman was also there and so on. So, but really in this period, late 19th, early 20th century, so especially in this area, uh, uh, people that were selling German, they were selling uh, pianos and so on. We are trying to collect all these stories. And of course, German beer beer breweries yeah, were also introduced here. Um, yeah, uh, after the first revolution, 1905, there was also a German newspaper, the Kaukasische Post, and this newspaper as the modern form of communication also highlighted the national identity before the religious one. So Arthur Leist, a famous uh, German who came from Breslau and nowadays Wroclaw, to Georgia and fell in love with Georgian literature, wrote a lot about this in German uh, in the late 19th century, reminded the Germans of their Germanness, so their readers of the Germanness, and you see that already in an imperial frame the national issue came up and grew stronger. Yeah? Uh, and of course, I'm just right now reading some materials about the independent period of Georgia, 1918, May 26, until uh, the arrival of the 11th Red Army, led by a Georgian, uh, Orjoni Kidze. Uh, there were also, Georgia continued to have good relations, diplomatic relations, because the German Empire wanted to get uh, the control over the manganese ore in Chiatura that was very important to uh, uh, harden steel and so on. But also after the uh, revolution in Munich there were also workers coming trying to find refuge in the democratic, social democratic republic of Georgia. Yeah? So as an alternative to the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Russia. Yeah? So, and some of them came, but this was nothing in comparison to what was happened 100 years before. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And of course, with the Soviet power, the situation worsened. Uh, religion was still very strong in the, in the rural communities, in the so-called colonies. But after Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union in June 1941, uh, first, of course, the Germans from the Volga Basin were uh, uh, deported to Central Asia because this was the front was approaching Moscow and so uh, uh, the Germans were counted as uh, non-reliable uh, and so but in uh, so the, the Volga Germans were deported in August and in October it was then the Caucasian Germans that were deported to uh, Kazakhstan mainly so it was about 24,000 people in uh, Georgia, 23,000 in Azerbaijan. You see there was just one settlement in Armenia, also a small one in nowadays Turkey, but it was uh, established too late. Overall about 47,000 people were deported to, uh, to Kazakhstan. So you see here Stalin's uh, 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 signature, so he uh, approved what uh, uh, Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria, uh, then uh, head of the um, National Committee of Internal Affairs, NKVD, uh, proposed to him. But of course, the Germans were not the only who were deported. There were other ethnic, ethnocultural groups that were deported from Georgia in the from the late 1930s into the 1940s. So the Soviet Union and the Republican level have, was very much also a nationalizing project. Mes, uh, Muslim Meschetians from Achal Siche, Samsa Javaheti region were deported to Central Asia, Fergana Valley, and also uh, Chechens and the North Caucasus and so on. And this was a way to homogenize, to nationalize the Soviet republics one Soviet Republic, one nationality. This was the policy in this period. But the story continues with it. Because in these empty settlements, this, uh, the Soviet Georgian authorities resettled Georgians from the mountains that were counted as being more resistant. So one, the unreliable Germans were deported to Central Asia and then the uh, um, people from Racha province in the mountainous area in western Georgia were resettled in, uh, in these villages. And I talked to some of them and they really uh, uh, said when we came there, you have to imagine World War II, there was a lot of hunger in the, in the home front so-called and so on. They came and then in, in the famous German uh, uh, um, cellars, they found a lot of uh, food stuff that was prepared for, for the winter season. Yeah? So, um, yeah. Then we are also one point is that uh, if a German woman was married to a non-German, she was exempted from deportation. So there were some Germans that continued to live in Georgia, that were not deported to Central Asia. And these were mainly women. I have one case where a Georgian woman in Bolnisi, in Katarinenfeld, married a Georgian, a German, sorry, and then she was asked, either you divorce, then you can stay, or you have to accompany your husband to, uh, to uh, Central Asia. And as, uh, the, the answer, as the people, the Georgians told me, so she decided to accompany her husband to, to Kazakhstan. Yeah? So, but it shows really what kind of patrimonial politics really in the deportation the Soviet authorities, the Soviet Georgian authorities applied. But these Germans, German women that stayed on in Tbilisi, they opened then so-called kindergartens and they uh, 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 transmitted German language and, and culture, Christmas culture and so on and so on to the Georgian intelligentsia of Tbilisi. That's why there are so many Georgian intellectuals, politicians and so on that are very good in, in, in German. Yeah? Only very few Germans that were deported returned to Georgia. A lot of them stayed in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and then in the late Soviet Union returned to uh, 
their ancient homeland, so to uh, Federal Republic of Germany, not the GDR, but Federal Republic in Germany, and there they were then perceived, I remember it from my uh, 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 youth, uh, uh, as Russians. So, in the Soviet Union they were really stigmatized as Germans, and then they come back and in Germany they were said, oh, you're Russian, so what's because the younger generation started to talk and to speak in Russian. Because the whole, the old community spirit, the, the, the closed uh, uh, communities that were living among themselves, preserving the old uh, 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 language and so on, this was dissolved in, the, in, in Kazakhstan. Yeah? But they have a lot of memories, so the elderly people and like the Russian Germans from the Volga Basin, created a special kind of literature, memoir, literature is called Heimatbuch, homeland book. There are a lot of these for different settlements in, 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 in the Soviet Union and of course here by uh, uh, Ernst Almendinger about Katharinenfeld Bolnisi, but there are others that have been uh, released and really it's a conglomerate of personal memories of statistical data and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we have also very recently for the 200th anniversary of the arrival of the first Germans, Tamta Milashvili, a Georgian writer and gender researcher, so women's studies and so on, she conducted oral history interviews with those Georgian Germans, German Georgians that we are still living in Tbilisi, in Bolnisi, in Asuret, in all these former uh, colonies. There are not many of them, but really collected this and this is a kind of uh, alternative or other memory of those that have not undergone the socialization over the uh, very harsh ex traumatic experiences of being deported to, with a, with a uh, uh, wagon to uh, uh, Kazakhstan and then Trut Armia, a lot of men had to work in the labor army, Trut Armia and so on and so forth. So a very interesting, unfortunately this book has not been translated into English or German yet, so it's only available in Georgian so far. Uh, in German we have translated a book about this German aunts. Uh, uh, it was published by Nino Lejava, who herself in the 1970s was attending such a kindergarten. It was illegal, but it was possible. It was not really, because also member of the party nomenclature attended it and, and so on. So, yeah. Uh, another way of how these uh, 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 survive. And now I'm coming to the present and the heritage, so this is our association that we established in 2014, in December 2014, really to uh, do something or uh, to, to assess, first to assess and then really to look, this was the anniversary where so we really tried to inventorize all what is here, what pre is preserved until today and it's, it's a lot. Then we have the different kind of exhibition. So if you go to Bolnisi, there's a very good regional museum with a special section on the German uh, colony in, in, uh, in um, Bolnisi, Katharinenfeld. We, uh, we, together with the University of Tübingen and the City Museum of Tübingen, we uh, developed a, a virtual exhibition. Uh, we did not yet uh, manage to have a house, establish a house museum in Bolnisi and also to create an integrative concept for communal development. I will come to that. So this is the inventory where really for several years we really collected all over the country what is there with GIS coordinates and so on and they got the status of the Georgian, uh, Georgian Agency for Cultural Heritage Protection that they are part of the heritage. Yeah? Um, so, then with the Council of Europe, because for me un not understandable, in Georgia, German is recognized as a minority language. But there is no German minority living in Georgia. So there are maybe 
1,000 people of German origin, most of them speak now Russian, very few preserved the German knowledge of German and still uh, uh, very, very, very little really, uh, still know the local Swabian dialect because this was the main form of communication among these uh, people there. Yeah? But we have these so you can download them, they are on the Council of Europe website and uh, um, yeah, just to show you then we be, uh, the, uh, now we are trying to uh, work on source publications on interreligious contact and establish a prosopographic database where this is a historian here then really to have a kind of micro history of how the, these Germans in their villages really interacted with the other with the Georgian communities around and so on and we have uh, uh, a very good uh, possibility because the archival materials are very well preserved. Yeah? Uh, the Caucasische Post, if somebody of you reads German, is also available in this Iverieli online library so uh, from 1906 and 1926, but this was more the intellectual national approach. The villagers the colonists in these German villages were much reluctant to uh, 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 take this national identity, they were much more religious, religiously driven and religion was much more important for them than nationality or national identity. Mm. Yeah, so and this is really a whole, uh, for a historian it's really uh, a treasure because after Stalin died in 1953 all the local church archives you know as a Protestant you have to be able to write and read so that you can have your own reading of the Holy Bible. So this was very important so they were all knew how to write and to read and they produced a lot of documents. They had church councils where they had their own um, uh, uh, minutes of the meetings, how and we, there we can see how religious uh, really directed their behavior in their everyday life. Yeah. This is so really a, a, a huge amount of materials. Uh, a lot of them are already online by the National Archive, but since they are written in uh, old style German script so-called Kurrentschrift. Nobody so far, no historian in Georgia, no in, not in Germany, was able to read them. So these materials are pristine. So nobody used them so far. Yeah? And of course this is for a historian a great opportunity. So about, you see so far 23 collections, so-called Fondi, are uh, digitalized with uh, 861 operations or Diela and these are uh, more than 27,000 pages of documents of these Germans from uh, the different colonies and from Tbilisi so we can really uh, very well re-establish this uh, uh, written material. Yeah? Um, and this is how we do it. So we have a, a computer program, this is Digital Humanities, maybe some of you have heard about it. Transcribus, this is helping us really transcribing all these handwritten sources, uh, the computer reading them, then we have editors who are editing it, so checking if the computer read it very well and so on and so forth because after they did this all after work, so the handwriting was not over, always very intelligible. Yeah? Uh, but so this is the way then where we can really uh, uh, transcribe all these sources and uh, learn step by step about the life in each of these communities. Yeah, so selection of suitable ar archival material because it's so many, then transcription, then editing and then we have also translation because we want to have uh, it published also available to a Georgian audience so they will be translated from uh, um, from German into into Georgian. A few a fewer part is also available in Russian 
And of course, you all know DeepL and other translation programs that are working so well. So from German, German into English should not be a problem with the help of DeepL. So this is the work procedure what we are doing. And so far we have about 3,000 pages transcribed. And uh, from these are 3, 2,400 in German, 340 in Russian, and so on and so forth. So and we are rolling on and still having not a, a total overview of, of what we have there and what still awaits us. Yeah? So really this is a whole uh, uh, for a huge group of, of scholars. So we have this database where we are slowly entering uh, um, biographic data of people because all these uh, uh, um, um, yeah, descendants of these German colonists are interested about the fate of their forefathers and foremothers and so on and then we can provide them and uh, with the database really access to prosopographical data who was born when married to whom from where though we can check how far really a big problem in, in this period for those close communities intermarriages that they did not all marry in the same village because uh, there was a problem of uh, genetic uh, defects and so on and so forth. So this is all what we can check them. Um, yeah, so this is a, a, a picture of Alexandrov here now today. This is old Tbilisi. High scrapers and so on and so forth. Alexandrov was outside at, so in Didube and they were producing diary products for Tbilisi. Yeah, something. This is where Expo Georgia uh, territory is. If you maybe you have been to the book fair last weekend or so, then uh, you know. So this is, and uh, this was the, the the Expo Georgia territory where the fields of this Alexander Dov. Yeah? Good. So we managed with our assessment to identify 23 settlements from with a date and so on, and located them. You see, mainly they were in this part south of uh, uh, Tbilisi, very few and very late were then established in Shida, uh, Kartli and a, a few at the beginning of the 20th century in Abkhazia, yeah? where there also were Protestant Estonians living there. So they choose the same, 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 the same church like here at the Metro Marjanishvili, maybe you have realized there is a small memorial plate to the church because this was a place where the church was uh, standing and Stalin instructed, ordered that the German prisoners of war had to demolish it. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we know now and uh, this is one example. So each of these blue points is one historic building. And Katharinenfeld Bolnisi is the main center of it really, has the highest potential as a touristic site because there are uh, uh, about 500 buildings still from this uh, uh, German period with a special uh, Fachwerk, so style of, in, in the UK you have it also, this kind of wooden and, and uh, wooden, yeah, sorry, so I'm not an architect and uh, so, but, uh, so we identified more than 1,400 buildings all over Georgia in these 23 settlements and really, and some of them, not all, got the status of a, a national cultural heritage. We want to uh, establish a historical territory area here. There is a church that is at the moment still used as a sports club but uh, as the oldest part of Bolnisi, really having this as a historical neighborhood or something like that. Not only the individual buildings, but the whole territory. We will see how we will succeed. This is, uh, uh, the local community is very committed to it because as a provincial town in Georgia, this is the way how to excel. So to income the provincialism and so on, to attract tourists are still today also coming Germans from Germany to visit the, uh, the, the village of their forefathers and looking for the house where they were living. Uh, this is uh, one of the four mills that were there. This is how it looked like and uh, uh, this is how it looks today. Another mill 
was uh, uh, restored, fully restored, and is now a hotel in uh, the German, so-called the German mill. So uh, functions as a hotel. So for those Germans that are coming back to visit to look for the sites where their grandfather has been born, or so on. Yeah. Um, sorry. This is Bolnisi, yes, yeah. It's more difficult really with Alexandersdorf in, uh, uh, in here in Didobe because we lost the fight with uh, uh, the mayor, mayor because we said it would be good uh, to have a, a small kind of at least one house to preserve it that is the most historic one as a museum to rem have a, a site there. But uh, uh, the investment companies for these you see here the uh, uh, high buildings and so are so strong that we lost this fight and the local people were attacking us and saying you are destroying our future because they were promised then to get a modern flat in such a kind of high scraper so this is how we restored this with a, a visual animation really how it looked like originally but this house we could not save it yet so if you manage Expo Georgia, Tsraltubo Street, and uh, Tsraltubo, and, um, uh, and so yeah, here is this Expo Georgia building, these st streets, this was with, and from these 30 something buildings that we had there, only 20 surviving yet, and in a couple of years there will be no left. So if you have some time, go there and see them as long as they are there. Because there is no German community, so nobody defending it. Yeah? Here we have from Asureti, Elisabethal. This was uh, the, the condition how we found it when we started. Uh, with, uh, this was used as also culture house with a, a concrete uh, uh, attachment there. And uh, thanks to the uh, municipal development fund from Tetrizgaro region, uh, they re-established the church in its old form but yeah it looks nice inside also but it has no function no use inside it's empty there are some pictures old pictures that they had for the opening but uh, what to do with it and this is something where we try to work maybe bringing an old organ and having then organ concerts there or something like that. it's half an hour from Tbilisi so while Pilis is more and more getting uh, into traffic jumps and so on, then over the weekend you can leave the city and then have visit this uh, uh, site and uh, go to a German restaurant or whatsoever. And uh, yeah, no. Here you see so for sale, Iridaba, uh, uh, these houses then really, uh, uh, uh. but then very often the people think. Ah, we can get a, a huge money out of it, even if they are falling apart, because these Germans, they are rich and so on, so have very high expectation. So a lot of these buildings are falling apart because nobody takes care of them. Or what we have, uh, this is a wine factory in Asoreti, would be perfect for music festivals and something like that, yeah. But falling apart because during the uh, 19, dark 1990s, somebody managed to get this ownership of this building and uh, waiting for an investor. But these investors didn't come and so it's more and more falling apart and we are then only uh, 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 documenting really the, the uh, decline of the, the conditions of, of, of declining condition of these buildings. Uh, yeah. The other way is if somebody makes some money, works in Tbilisi, Asureti is called a sleeping village, so they sleep there and go to work in Tbilisi, and then this happens, yeah, that they improve the conditions as they think, but of course the authenticity is being lost. Yeah? So, and of course this is also a challenge, because if, if a village would like to, to merchandise it, so to commodify it, then they have to, to have a concept of how to make it pleasant for tourists and whatsoever. No? This is in a mountain area, uh, Trialeti. Uh, this was Alexander Silf. And there the local population, there are only three, 30 families living there. 
they reappropriated the church building and doing uh, their own. They do not have a priest and so on. They do Greeks there and so pray together in a very uh, 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 yeah pleasant way. So uh, um, and here we oops. Here we renovated the, uh, the roof so that when the roof is destroyed then you cannot secure the buildings. No? But re interesting was really that they, the, the local population that is living there now really are using it in their way and not in a very nationalist or religious ideological way because a Greek minority living there and uh, 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 yeah. So what for or through whom? So what to do, and uh, um, I do not know how far you are aware of Georgian society. I'm very interested in this way, and Georgian society is very much built on what is called bonding social capital. So social relations, friendship, so your peer, peer groups, this is the main important point that is driving uh, not only the personal life but also politics. Now they call it polarization between those who are in the ruling party and those who are in the opposition party. But there is no bridging capital built on uh, uh, certain ideas, common ideals and so on and so forth that really would help. And this is a big problem that we have only these personalized we groups that do not allow really to uh, have policy approaches that can help not only to secure German cultural heritage but also Georgian one and so on and we see it all over Georgia in mountain areas, Ushguli, Tusheti and so on that really it's only making money, making profits as fast and do not care about uh, uh, the heritage here. Yeah? So. Okay, so the Possible goal would be then the revitalization of intangible heritage for strategic decision for the development of the community and the region. So using this heritage, be it German, Georgian or whatsoever, as a means really to establish a sense of community that is going beyond face-to-face -face groups and beyond private interest uh, 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 groups, yeah? uh, uh, profit interests, sorry. Yeah, so this is really how then we manage then to uh, renovate some of the buildings. Some will be in Asoreti. We have quite a good possibility to establish a local museum. We could prevent them to take away these wooden original, uh, uh, um, yeah, what is this? Um, they w sorry? Wooden, uh, yeah. So? Fence, yeah, thank you, fence. The wooden fences, they wanted to replace it with uh, metal fences that would not really have fit there at all. Yeah, uh, so good. And one uh, possibility, what we also have seen, so there was a, a from Stuttgart, so one of the regions from where these Germans were, uh, invited urban sketchers. This was an urban movement. Uh, protesting against the new train station construction in the mid of Stuttgart and they are making sketches. So they made these kind of sketches so really using it also as a means for bringing different cultures together and so on. So they came also to Bolnisi, Gartenstraße uh, and so on. Yeah, we had summer school with uh, students, Georgians, Germans and so on. Uh, uh, coming then and assessing, developing ideas, uh, what to do. Um, yeah. Then there is the possibility uh, in, in German, I don't know if it's the, in the UK, you have young craftsmen that are traveling. Uh, so, uh, I do not know if it's the correct journeyman, so traveling and working for free if they get accommodation, food, and a little bit of money to buy beer. They told me we do not drink wine, we want beer, but they of course know the craftsmanship to preserve these buildings and now we are trying to connect them with the local communities, with the house owners, if they provide them accommodation, money for beer, some food and so on, they, they can come and really help in restoring these buildings. Yeah? Or other was really 
you see uh, one of those organs at home because for the pietists it was very important to have these music instruments at home and to on Sundays to sing to God uh, uh, very strong so the, that the local house owners really are doing something like uh, uh, Airbnb or say renting out the guest houses and something like that really trying to use this heritage as a way to improve their socio-economic condition. Yeah? In uh, Tübingen with our project we had a partner, so there is uh, already a virtual itinerary. We uh, um, have a lot of things that are now available online. If somebody is interested I can share with you the, 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 uh, the slides or so and you can look it up really what we developed really using very modern uh, uh, um, um, digital tools really to make these things more accessible but of course as a historian I know it's a, time, it's a fight against the time we cannot stop it we can only try to preserve it in a way and to keep it alive in a different way this is our latest where we the former local administration building the Dorfschulzenamt has been renovated and now we are sharing it with the local a cultural agency in, uh, in Bornisi and we have space there for events so if you want to have a, a training or lectures in Bornisi you are welcome to do them there but of course I would prefer them in spring or summer season that's much nicer then you know? but you can use it then okay textbook so it was really in textbooks it found its way to the textbook uh, uh, um, but uh, then an online, but this is not functional, uh, an online route where you could uh, an, uh, download an app about all the historical sites all over Georgia, a big project some five years ago, and then it shows you where in your neighbor, in, uh, so with your app, and then it shows you here, 500 meters, there is a historical site or a monument, but it's not functioning any longer. So it was really prepared, and after two years it became dysfunctional but we prepared then a cultural route in Georgia for that. Yeah that was it uh, so you can uh, find us on Facebook if somebody is more interested of course you can write in English in Russian whatever you like so we answer also in Georgian um, yeah I hope it was interesting but probably too long yeah no yeah okay one hour so, sorry for being too long and, uh, yeah. Maybe you have questions or... Yeah, it, it, it was perfectly fit <laughs> in time. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there are some questions. Yes. Thank you for your lecture, it was very interesting. Um, how were the German colonists received by the people of the Caucasus region when they first arrived? Well, I did not uh, get oh, the sorry. first part. How were the German colonists received by the people of the Caucasus when they first arrived? Yeah, of course, uh, you have to see, so they were newcomers in a, a very dense and uh, there were a lot of wars between uh, Ottoman Empire uh, so the situation for the local population was not really much better than for the situation that the German colonists left behind. But they were ordered to, uh, uh, to help them and uh, probably they were also uh, um, helpful because they, they, they have seen in what kind of dire conditions they have uh, uh, arrived, when they have arrived. Yeah? So, uh, but unfortunately we do not have original sources from these people because uh, they did not know how to write and so uh, it's difficult really to, to trace this back. Yeah? Only if in the administrative documentation there is something that there was a fight or something over. But when the Germans in the second half established their economic potential and were trying to expand and to acquire new territories then there were problems because this went at the expense of the local peasants that had to pay their uh, uh, um, um, 
yeah, taxes or uh, um, to the Lord, because this was a very feudal society, very, uh, 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 yeah, hori uh, um, hierarchical, yes, so patron-client relationship, and this is something really that then uh, uh, deteriorated, so, but the, the communities, the Germans were then living very much really for themselves, and uh, only in the 20th century we find that there were increased also mixed marriages with non-Germans and so on, but for a long period they tried to keep among themselves. It's different in the environment here in Tbilisi, in Neutiflis, because there were a lot of people that were uh, arriving, not Germans, so Neutiflis in the second half of the uh, 19th century became urban and very multicultural, we would say, yeah? so with really people from different parts uh, of Europe arrived here then. Mm -hmm. But this was urban, so this was uh, different from um, rural areas. Mm -hmm. More questions? Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was in Azareti a couple of weeks ago and uh, went into the church and I saw all of the pictures on there. So I was wondering if there was some kind of, if there was like a movement going on to like renovate or, or not renovate, but preserve the German cultural heritage there. Um, so it's really interesting to hear about your projects and everything that's going on. Um, and I was just wondering, you touched on um, some like bilateral work that you uh, that you've been working on in Tübingen and Tübingen, and I was just wondering, is there any more that um, like any more within Germany about sort of like the German colonists in the Caucasus that you are working on, sort of like I don't know, building into the education system or any more kind of events like that? Hmm. Yeah. So uh, in Tübingen for them. Uh, they started really that they realized we do not know so much about these so-called Russian Germans. They were stigmatized in the receiving German community, in the German society. And then really a, a, a colleague, a professor of German language and literature and from the city museum, they contacted us and then we elaborated this project. And they are now continuing collecting oral history statements by uh, descendants of these families that are living uh, in different parts of Germany right now, but integrated it into their main exhibition, permanent exhibition. So it's now a part, this history of out-migration, that Germany, because many Germans did neglect this, that Germany became an immigration country, but it was also once an emigration country, and that this something, or emigration society, and that this is something that they also wanted to contribute to, to diversify and to, to have a more informed knowledge about this, yeah? And also from the local, uh, from the local perspective, so really from these uh, Tübingen, Reutlingen, and so on, that they really went there. No? So uh, uh, there is a lot to be done because uh, until today you see that the, the Russian Germans partly have also a different uh, 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 perspective, for example, on the war in Ukraine nowadays and so on. And this also, uh, because it's, we started of course much before, but they have a different uh, socialization and so on and were not properly integrated into German society, like a lot of other migrants that did not have German ancestry, yeah? so, but um, we're working on it. More questions? Again, thank you very much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I've got two questions. So my first question is um, for the um, deportation of Germans um, during World War II. Um, is there a reason that they were deported to Kazakhstan and not back to Germany? Um, and my second question is, like, how aware of, are Georgians nowadays of this kind of heritage, um, this history of Germans, German immigration, uh, immigration, and like, how much is it taught in schools and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. 
here in, in, in Georgia, yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the first question is, of course, in the period 1941, uh, uh, the Soviet Union was at war with Germany. Germany attacked the Soviet Union. In 1939, they concluded the famous uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop or Hitler-Stalin pact. That was an agreement at, uh, among two dictators about really being neutral to each other. This gave Hitler the opportunity to start the war again against Poland and then UK uh, uh, supported the uh, uh, um, so uh, the uh, territorial integrity of Poland, and so then it started the war with the UK, and, and so on. So therefore, it was not possible to send the Germans back to Germany. Yeah? Um, after the Molotov Ribbentrop, they agreed on certain territorial uh, uh, changes, and Germans in Bessarabia, what is Moldova today, uh, were then resettled back to the Reich, as it was called, yeah? back home in, in, in a way to their original homeland. This is very much related to these racial ideas of use, uh, 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 so of the blood legacy. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so this is, it was impossible, but a lot of other ethnic groups, nationalities, like the Chechens, and so they were all deported back into the uh, hinterland where there was no uh, 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 um, chance to collaborate with the German occupiers, with the German attackers and that's yeah, so. In, in the history textbooks, uh, this is something what expresses general the very positive view that Georgia has to Germany. Therefore, it was much easier to integrate this part into the history textbooks than about Muslim minorities from Mesheti region, because uh, uh, there are much more um, objections uh, after the experience of the uh, territorial separatist conflicts with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, that then these national minorities could claim their territory, especially the Armenians and so on. So therefore, there is still uh, quite some uh, uh, rejection about acknowledging the homogenizing policy that the Soviet Georgian authorities conducted in the 1940s. We are currently, I have one PhD student who is working on the resettlement policy in the 1940s for the Chechens and then how Georgian Hefsurians were resettled into the emptied villages of the Chechens in the North Caucasus. So Hefsureti is a part of Georgia where Georgian mountaineers are living but it's on the northern side of the Mount Caucasus range. Yeah? And then they were settled there. In the 1950s, these Hefsuretians were resettled to the lowlands also, uh, uh, but not that violently as it was done in, uh, with the Chechens, for example, or the Meshetians, who were then really uh, uh, disseminated uh, in, in different parts of Central Asia. And uh, um, yeah, so this is not, uh, so uh, uh, that much critically reflected in history textbooks. Yeah? Not yet. I hope this will come because it's very important when I see how also in Georgia recently uh, national identity issues were really used for as political arguments. Uh, uh, this is quite dangerous uh, to rely on these old uh, Soviet style kind of arguments. Yeah? Like uh, Putin did it in, in Russia, but they're in an imperial framework. Here it's on a smaller scale, on a national framework, neglecting the diversity in the past. Belisi was not a, a, a Georgian city. It became a Georgian city after the Sovietization, and especially in the 1940s and 50s, then it had a majority of ethnic Georgians. Yeah? And now you see everywhere there are monuments to Georgian writers and so on and so forth. Yeah? So the Trinity Cathedral on the mountain here yeah? so was built on the Armenian cemetery. So it means Georgian symbolic power was supplanting the heritage of uh, the Armenians that were living in Avlabar. Yeah? So therefore, 
uh, of course I try to be uh, uh, to, to pr support also my students in developing critical thinking on on the on the past that is not just black and white but that we have to differentiate yeah also with these Germans that they uh, it's not that always that bright but so far we have to look up uh, more in, in more detail greater detail really how was the relationship and of course if it is a, the very past so from the 19th century we have to rely on written sources we cannot interview the people that have some memories of, of, of their grandparents and so on what they were trailing so it means if somebody of you is interested in memory studies so we are still in this transition from what was called communicative memory what still people share with their family in their families as oral uh, memories is more shifting towards cultural memory so we are the the people working on the cultural memory to think of how to use these objects of the past for the future to create a link with the past and to, to yeah, no? Thank you. Uh, it was on your slide that uh, the, mm, the first three generation of uh, German migrants was not self-sustainable in the meaning of food. So how they were able to survive? Like the, the, the Russian government were uh, providing them food or yeah. what? Yeah. I, I do not know how, what kind of realistic assumptions uh, the Russian Tsarist administration had, but they were able to a lot, of course, this was then uh, 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 the local population had to bring the food and to help them, so they were urged to do so with the Cossacks or the, the military that were there, they said, so you, you have to bring them something. Yeah? So, but then they expected something, the expectations were quite high, and when it didn't happen for 20 years, yeah, until 1836, they got really, uh, uh, yeah, not uncomfortable, but angry. And you see really in uh, the, the statements that I gave there, those were really quite, uh, they are lazy, they are not working, not really trying to understand what were the reason for that. Yeah? But they, because the Russian state, the empire, really invested a lot in them. Yeah, but th the actual reason was they were expecting to to have an apocalypse uh, soon, right? Uh, it to was have the real reason they were not really working, uh, like trying to integrate, because they were waiting for apocalypse, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they wanted then to move on to migrate to Jerusalem. So when uh, uh, the Lord is coming and Jesus Christ returning, then to be there. Yeah. And then when they st started to prepare for that, then the Cossacks came and said. No, 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 you have to stay here. And of course, the, the world did not go down. And so they realized, and then they had to, to readapt to the new situation. But this was then the beginning when they became really uh, 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 economically active and when they really uh, uh, fully exploited the potential that they had. Uh -huh. yeah, but is it like some, uh, some sect who is uh, expecting the apocalypse? Apocalypse is like Protestants, I never yeah, heard yeah. about them. Yeah, yeah, this was a special, so under Pietists and so on, there was Hiliasts. Oh. They were called Hiliasts who were really expecting very strong believing. Yeah, but of course uh, this was very broad in southern Germany, in, in parts of Switzerland and so on. Very strong this uh, belief that this is uh, happening. And uh, yeah, and then really they, uh, again returned with all their uh, uh, capacities and, and their belief and so on into improving the, the, the living condition and so on in their colonies. Yeah, so since 1836 and so the first two generations were, uh, had a very hard time but the third generation this was then really that could take in the harvest economic condition. We can see it also in the buildings, the very, the very first buildings, very small, one, two rooms, and then they ended up in a two floor for ten, with 10 rooms and then some families got richer and so on, like this Almendinger who wrote this book because he left in 1930 after the Great Depression when he realized in the Soviet Union 
uh, the decolacization started yeah? and he realized as an entrepreneur there was no chance for him so he applied for German citizenship, got it and then returned. Before he returned he took pictures, all this what is in his book, so we, the, the state what he uh, uh, um, collected was uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. You will find a lot of these pictures in, in the museum and the book is also online on uh, uh, Iverieli on this Georgian online library of the public library of Georgia. So you can download it, 150 megabyte or something, then you can see all the pictures and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So any more questions? Ah, here we have one descendant of a Georgian German family. Yeah? Yeah, indeed, actually, my great-grandmother was a German, a Georgian-German uh, from Tbilisi. And, well, just like uh, one note, you mentioned Marjanishvili Metro Station and the church which was standing there. And in my childhood, and I actually I grew up in this uh, neighborhood, this place was called Kirichni from Kirche, from yeah. actually from this word. The, and still old Tbilisi dwellers still call it actually uh, this way. Uh, my so question is that, obviously, I was very saddened to hear the fate of this, like, German... Uh, like small settlement, the remnants of the settlement in Didube, well, yeah. saddened but not surprised, uh, unfortunately. So my like concern is: Have you like addressed, or are you really bothering? Because sometimes it's necessary like to bother the Ministry of Culture, for instance, like on a permanent basis, or. Um, well, I myself like remember when I worked in like um, in a public sector like a um, couple of decades ago, when the object was nominated at least to the like UNESCO World Heritage List or something like some part, for instance like Old Tbilisi is a part of the UNESCO World Heritage, it's like some parts of Ntsheta, some parts of like Old Svaneti. Maybe, mm. maybe this, this provides significant protection and uh, now for instance like these high rises and modern hostels are impossible to be built in Svaneti at the place of these like towers and other historical buildings. So is it possible to do something from international community is German embassy active is yeah. the, uh, are you trying yeah. to kind of inform Ministry of Culture is it as so as are you fighting <laughs> basically speaking uh, so we get several got several grants from German embassy yeah Marjanishvili street was called Kirochnaya Kirochnaya Ulica so Kirchenstrasse church street yeah so and in in the local memory it survived very long also like a Sabrücken square uh, referring to the friendship of cities between Saarbrücken, but there is no historic one. It started in the 1970s, but still the local people remember it as Varantsov, uh, Varantsovi. So where the monument to the Viceroy Varantsov, who was a, a governor of the Viceroy in the mid 19th century. So there is some, some point that really local memory can be very strong and survive, but uh, yeah. Um, we get all the support from the embassy because they of, of course are also interested in it. We had meetings with the Ministry of Culture, but the whole National Agency for Cultural Heritage Protection, a lot of them have been fired under the new Minister of Culture. The website where the, all the national uh, 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 heritage sites are documented, where you can go on, is not functioning. So there is no way to control if there is some historical site destructed for building purposes. So here in Tbilisi it's very difficult. Yeah? So, but therefore outside Tbilisi with Asureti, with a local administration or Bolnisi, we have very good collaboration and... and it's, easier hmm? it's easier. Yeah, yeah. But we need now to, to, to get in touch with the local dwellers in these houses so to con convince them that they can make more out of it if they preserve uh, uh, the authenticity of these buildings and then trying to help them to make a business plan as a guest house or the, that we have a fair of uh, 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 different kind of cultural activities there because all these houses have very uh, uh, well preserved uh, cellars, basements with a, con te a continuous temperature of 14 centigrade degree in winter, in summer and so on because of the special 
air uh, system and uh, um, so really to th make them think a little bit in an entrepreneurial way because all of them are sitting and waiting when does the state come and help us to renovate our house yeah and and of course this is something where we can also not say that uh, we are doing it for them and uh, uh, yeah so we do not have with we are an association uh, uh, and and working with grants so this is uh, not possible so we can try to share as much as possible the knowledge the expertise a lot we have in our board uh, uh, Nestan Tatarashvili who is the author of this book where all these 1400 houses have been uh, selected in a way that it is uh, um, unfortunately I did not bring a copy of it um, but uh, uh, in, in a popular way so that it is available to, to a broader audience in German, Georgian and in English. So it has also an English part and a lot of pictures. So I only could show a, a, a few of them. Yeah? But Didobe, Alexanderdorf, we had met with Karlazo, with the mayor, with the, with the local mayor of Didobe district. Now she is a member of parliament and uh, nobody is accessible any longer for that. Yeah? Narmania, the previous mayor, was uh, very much interested into that because he was coming from this neighborhood, he was aware of it and he wanted to do something like a special, so also to diversify touristic attractions all over Tbilisi, that it's not only an uh, 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 old city and Amashenebeli, but then there, there are also other sides. This would be with him, but then he uh, yeah, was replaced and that was it. Thank you very much. I think we will wrap up for tonight. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I will make sure that we would uh, share all the links on our description uh, on YouTube and on our social media because mm. there is a lot to dig into after the lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really hope, we haven't discussed it yet, but I really hope that you can be back next year to our talk series and maybe to talk about the first Georgian Republic and the influence of Germany. Oh. Uh, I can also talk about the Stalin cult in Georgia. <laughs> this might be also oh, interesting. Oh, oh mm. this one. We definitely have uh, a bunch of topics to yeah. discover yeah. with you. Mm. Thank you very much one more time. Welcome and <laughs> wish you good luck with your studies here in Tbilisi and hope you will enjoy it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And I want to briefly announce the next talk was going to be next Wednesday with uh, Patman Kereselidze, uh, who is uh, one of the last remaining uh, um, carpets restorer in Georgia. And we're going to talk about, again, about uh, some cultural side of things uh, next week and uh, the, the language of symbols and orm ornaments and uh, features of different carpets uh, which are a big part of local culture and the culture of the region in general. So we're going to dig into some ornaments of uh, Georgia, Armenia, Iran, Turkey too and to, to learn wh what are the challenges and why not so many people are doing it these days and why it's important to preserve it. So stay tuned. We're going to announce it everywhere closer and to the date and please uh, feel free to support helping to live as always we are really 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 appreciating any amount any coins for people in ukraine thank you very much have a good night <laughs>